Welcome, dear friends, to this worship on this summer Sunday, a season that has a flavor like no other. It's always fresh and simmered in sunshine. It's good to have you uh, with us from home or office or beach or national park or wherever you may be uh, tuning in from. I'm Tom Hostetler, one of the pastors here at the Church of the Brethren, and I'm joined by Amanda Bennett, our Minister for uh, Children, Youth, and Families. And we together welcome you to this time of reflection and celebration and worship. Uh, as always, I want to offer my thanks to the people who are working both in front of and behind the uh, the, the cameras uh, to put this service together. It takes a whole team of people to make that happen, and we are so grateful for what they do. If you are new to our congregational worship, we'd be glad to know you a little better. And for that purpose, we've placed a connection tab on our website at lavernecob.org under the Connect tab. So tell us about yourself, and if you have a concern that we can address or just how we can get to know you a little better, we would be glad to know about that. The sermon this morning takes a look at Christian patriotism, a topic I've been thinking about since last week's national celebration of Independence Day. I hope you'll stay with us and enjoy the worship. God bless you. For this land with its peaks and valleys, coasts and deserts, fields and meadows, we thank our creator God. For our community, for those who came before us in this place, and for our neighbors near and far, we thank the God of all people. For those who laid the foundation of our democracy and who pledged liberty and justice for all, we thank the God of hope and freedom. We pray for all the nations of the world, that they might always be na nations which defend and promote liberty and freedom, truth and justice. We pray to the God who is spirit and compassion, that we might always be a nation where all are free to seek their own potential. We pray to our God that we might be a beacon of freedom to all those who live under the shadow of terror and hopelessness. We, we pray, pray to the God of redemption and peace. Let us pray. God of all nations, we gather in this place from different walks of life, and we gather to worship you. We welcome your spirit of hope, compassion and peace into our hearts, our minds, and our bodies this day. May we breathe in compassion for ourselves and breathe out compassion into the world. Amen. Thank you. 
Our second scripture today comes from Romans 13, 1 through 5. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval, for it is God's agent for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the agent of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. We have just celebrated the 4th of July. <clears throat> Probably some of you saw a parade in a town where uh, you live. You know, it's odd. We have lived uh, here a dozen years, but I, somehow I have never seen the Laverne, Church, the Laverne Parade. We've always been uh, in Torrance celebrating Angie's mother's birthday, which was on the 4th, and we happen to be down there this year. And so every year we have always enjoyed the fireworks all along the freeway, coming home for an hour and a half. It's just, it, it comes up all over the freeway. It's, it's marvelous to see. As a young kid from the country, it was always one of my favorite holidays. From my earliest childhood, I have loved the the, the three-hour parade in Lakeville, Indiana, it took every citizen who lived there to be in the parade, to really make it a parade, with every horse, dog, tractor, baton twirler, bands, old cars that the organizers could find. Never understood why they put the horses first. That was just mean. Every church had a float, and I was often on ours, dressed up like uh, an old brethren preacher <laughs> with a fake beard and a hat and a plain cut coat. I loved the, uh, the Little League baseball games, the hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill, the concerts in the park, and the fireworks show in the evening. It always seemed to me to be a day to celebrate our, our neighbors and our land and our freedom. Still, I'm not one to join uh, God and country too closely. I believe that theocracy is dangerous for nations and religions alike. That issue is in the news, as you know, uh, as the Supreme Court weighed in recently saying that it is no danger to allow a government employee in this case, a public school teacher, to lead Christian prayers on the 50-yard line of a football field. I wonder what will happen when the local imam, Muslim imam, asks to lead prayers at the goal line. That will test their convictions about free religious expression. So this year, uh, the passing of Independence Day for me was an occasion for reflection and even confession of the dissonance between reality and aspiration in the national life. All countries are imperfect and ambiguous, uh, and the United States is no exception. We have high ideals and sometimes dismal realities. We have often responded too slowly to the challenges of the moral arc of history. We have proclaimed the equality of humankind and defined some persons as non-human, unworthy of self-determination, equality, or loving relationships. We have affirmed the quest for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and condemn some persons based on the accidents of economics, ethnicity, or sexuality to live lives of misery, duplicity, and limitation. 
In the last few years, we have seen more distrust and cynicism about government, voter suppression, and attempts at unfair elections, false claims about election fraud, the worsening of political polarization, the worst we have seen since the Civil War. We have seen setbacks on issues of gun violence, women's rights, LGBTQI plus rights, and minority rights. Some preachers and politicians say that the solution to America's problems is getting back to God. They say that a national day of prayer will bring America back to its glory days, whichever those were. While I affirm the importance of values and spirituality and national well-being, I believe there is another more important question. What kind of God do we invoke when we ponder the life of a nation, every nation, and the destiny of a planet? In raising the connection between our images of God and our national policies, I am not suggesting that we turn to a theocracy and its close political cousin, authoritarianism and fascism. I cherish our pluralism and the implied democracy of revelation in our nation, even among atheists and agnostics. But for those of us who call ourselves people of faith, how we understand God may be a matter of life and death and may be a formative factor in shaping foreign legal and economic policy. George Bancroft was an American historian who wrote a 10-volume history of the United States. And to him, the revolution represented one phase of a master plan by God for the march of all mankind toward a golden age of greater human freedom. He believed, as I think many Americans today believe, that America or at least one portion of it, represents the forces of life and God and freedom, and anyone who opposes them represents the powers of tyranny, evil, and oppression. Bancroft believed that the revelation was achieved in the colonies because the American people were united in a manifest destiny. Except that's not true. Only about a third of all people in the colonies were in favor of the revolution. And you could reduce that number further if you included people like women, African Americans, and indigenous people, basically anybody who wasn't white, male, and a property owner. None of the others had a voice. Certainly our own spiritual ancestors, the brethren, along with the Mennonites and Quakers, were considered Tories, loyal to Britain, partly because of this scripture that we read today from Romans, which teaches that all Christians should be, quote, subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. They were also opposed to war, trying to follow Jesus' own spirit and example, they were considered, therefore, disloyal. That's worth pondering. And when a law was passed in Pennsylvania that required every citizen to swear an oath renouncing allegiance to the British government and pledging allegiance to the colony, two things happened. Many brethren families moved to different parts of the country and those who did not leave were subject to torture, robbery, and sometimes death. In the case of a Germantown Brethren minister whose name was Christopher Sauer, who owned a printing press and was the biggest newspaper competitor of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin wrote in English, Sauer wrote in a German. Franklin put together a, a group of militia which marched to Germantown, arrested Sauer, destroyed his press, 
burned down his house, charged him with disloyalty, stripped him bare, shaved off his beard, made him march in circles for hours until he fell from exhaustion. Others weren't that lucky. In our own day, I am uncertain if our political leaders will embrace alternatives to the God of manifest destiny. Versions of American exceptionalism, exceptionalism show up virtually in every politician's speech, sometimes seriously, often gratuitously, and the view of white American supremacy is winning over hearts and minds. It brought us to the brink on January 6th. So, in case someone asks you what you think about Christianity and America, <laughs> let me suggest a different version, a different vision of God and patriotism. The, the Christian doctrine of uh, omnip the omnipresence of God, uh, we affirm that. We seldom do we think about the practical meaning of that. To say that God is present and acting in every person and situation means that there are no boundaries either to love or to revelation. That is, if we affirm that the God we worship reflects the life and teaching of Jesus. Because for Jesus, love was the primary spiritual principle. God's love included our enemies as well as our fellow citizens. It embraced the poor as well as the wealthy, and the forgotten as well as the privileged. Accordingly, God's presence and action are to be understood primarily in terms of love. The only power from this perspective that God embodies is loving power. And this must ultimately include everyone, not just a select few. There are no outsiders to God's love, and that includes nations as well as individuals. God loves the United States, and God loves every other people. That was the children's story this morning, and it was well done. Amen? Which is a great answer, I think, if anyone asks you what brethren believe. What is patriotism, then, as understood from that worldview? It was Brethren Elder John Klein who said, My highest conception of patriotism is found in the one who loves the Lord God with all their heart and their neighbor as themselves. Out of these affections spring the subordinate love for one's country, love truly virtuous for one's companion and children, relatives and friends, and in its most comprehensive sense takes in the whole human family. Were this love universal, the word patriotism, and its specific sense, meaning such a love for one's country as makes his possessors ready and willing to take up arms in its defense, might be appropriately expunged from every national vocabulary. 1864. Christians of our persuasion have sometimes said we live in two kingdoms. We live in the kingdom of the world and we live in the kingdom of God. On the one hand, we are citizens of a nation which, at its best, offers freedom and opportunity, prosperity, toleration, respect, and defense of human rights to people of all races, creeds, and religions. When it shares its wealth, when it shares its knowledge and expertise with the needs of the world, assistance in agriculture, medicine, engineering, help to millions of people who are living on the edge of poverty, 
mental illness, and all kinds of social needs. When it does that, we can feel proud to be an American. But we must not forget that the United States is a nation in the world. The United States is not a Christian nation. It never was and it never will be. In the advice that the Apostle Paul gave to the Romans, who, by the way, were under the authority of who? Nero, in the Roman Empire, he gives this advice. He says that we are to be responsible to be good and decent citizens of the world wherever we may be. But primarily, first and foremost, we are citizens of the kingdom of Christ. I respect the flags of all nations, but I give allegiance to the flag of no nation. My allegiance is to the kingdom of God. As American Christians, we seek another way of living, continuing the work of Jesus, peacefully, simply, together. That makes us responsible citizens. Christian patriotism teaches that people are more important than things. Christian patriotism teaches that life is sacred. Christian patriotism teaches that intolerance and racism is wrong. Christian patriotism teaches us to love our enemies. Christian patriotism teaches us that the heart of all religion is love. Love is our only hope. Let us pledge allegiance to the God for the healing of all nations in the prayer that every nation may be a beacon to freedom and a place of love in action. Amen. A little bit uh, blown away right now. I know I am. So, but yes, let's stand.
go into the world assured of God's presence and leading. May God's grace and peace and joy be with you all, now and always. Amen.